The annual global celebration of the woman is here again and coincidentally the first woman and the first African to be appointed as a DG of the World Trade Organization has just resumed office. Interesting, right? There are thousands of things to be known about this woman and Coco TV has just taken this bold step of bringing you all of the things that you do not know about the wonderful Ngozi Okonjo Iweala. Join me as I speak with Onye Iweala, the first and eldest child of the Ngozi Okonjo Iweala family. This is Lyo Shobo and you're watching Coco TV Nigeria. This new appointment, how did it go down? And then first off, how was the process? How was the process for you? for dad, for your brothers, and even for mom, how was the process? And then when it eventually came, how did, did it go down? You know, the celebration and everything, right. how did it go down? I mean, the first thing I'll say is that this process is very arduous and it's very mm. stressful. And of course the people yeah. feeling the acute stress was number one, my mom for sure felt the acute stress, but also my father, you know, he has been a fantastic support, you know, also for my mom. And so he, you know, he's out there trying to like keep her calm, keep her sane in the midst of a very grueling and sometimes confusing <laughs> process. So there was stress on him. There was also stress on my aunts and my uncles, you know, because they're also trying to support my mom in this whole process. And then similarly for my siblings, Uzo, um, Kechuka, and Uchechi. So I think overall, I would say this was a stressful process, but the, the acuity of the stress decreased, you know, depending the further distance away from my mom, but everyone felt something. And it's because the, the, I mean, basically what I was saying was, this is the strangest job application and interview process I have ever witnessed. And it was muted because we are in a pandemic. So in times when it's not a pandemic, the candidates are expected to fly across the world. You know, Maybe you'll be in Barbados this day, then in Fiji the next day, then Japan, you know, then Senegal, then you know, going from country to country, meeting with all of the ministers to try to convince them that you're the best candidate for the job. So there's travel involved. And that was muted because of the pandemic, but it still meant there were multiple Zoom calls, this call, that call. Then secondly, you have almost like an exam of sorts. So not only do you have to have travel, political skill, you know, and, and diplomacy, but you also have to know what you're talking about. This is trade, you know? And my, I've never seen my mom, she was like, preparing you know my mom is like a development economist the lady is brilliant she knows all sorts of stuff she was the finance minister for nigeria you know she was involved in customs trade all that stuff and even my mom was sitting down preparing studying making sure that she understood the details related to trade you know because when they interview you they ask you those details they want to make sure they're getting the best person for the job so when you combine th those different kinds of skill sets needed with the stress of the situation, add to that the political overlay, you know, with, which happened with the initial Trump administration, first going along with the process and then at the last minute, like saying, oh no, oh, oh, we don't think it was a fair process. And then being in limbo while we were waiting to see, okay, is the new US administration with Biden, are they gonna agree? It was very stressful. <laughs> so but at the end of it all it came out you know amazing exactly. and <laughs> joyful so she resumed where well, she resumed that two days ago how did that mm -hmm. go how 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 was the celebration how was yeah. even the celebration of the appointment of the appointment itself I, so i have to say it was pretty thrilling i mean in the summertime when it looked like she was getting closer and closer to being the number one pick we were already starting to get excited and then we went into this limbo um, but I, I mean, when she was, when it was actually announced and they started doing television interviews in our house in Maryland, and like, we could see the Zoom video of her accepting the appointment and so forth. It's just, it's mind blowing. It's like surreal. You know, I mean, you keep saying to yourself, God is good. God is good. God is great. But it's nuts. I'm like, this lady is making history in so many different ways. Plus, she, she's coming at such a critical time for trade, you know, when it comes to dealing with this pandemic and a lot of collapsing economies throughout the world. And so I'm like, wow, this lady has to do all this stuff. And guess what? This lady is also my mom, you know, who calls and says, how's Adora? How's Kelechi? You know, how's Emeka? Those are my three kids. You know, she, she's, 
So I'm like, on the one hand, she's trying to figure out how will I get China and the US, you know, to be at the table. But on the other hand, she's like, oh, how's Andrew doing? That's my husband, you know. How, well, how is school today? How is soccer? I'm just amazed at how she can balance that stuff. But my aunt really wanted to have some kind of celebration. And so, you know, it's again, we're kind of muted because of the pandemic. But as soon as we can get everyone together, we're planning to travel to Switzerland and have some kind of celebration. Yeah. That, that would be so, so amazing, like really. So you talked about um, she balancing all of these things. How do you think she does it? Because really, it, it baffles me. It really, really baffles me. And then um, growing up, how did this affect you? You know, our choice of career, our availability to manage and run the home. How did it affect mm-hmm. you? How? I, so I have to say that my mom provided me a phenomenal example of the struggles and then what you have to do to juggle work and life. But she showed me that it's possible that you don't have to give up your career to be a good mother and you don't have to give up family, children in order to have a great career. And I think that's powerful for me because I think that we need women to be you know, in the public sphere, in the professional sphere. I think it's critical because I think it makes our world better. And then at the same time, I think it's really important for children to be able to see both parents involved in domestic life and involved in raising them. And I think that when you have a working mom, that means that your dad, who is a working dad, is also a parenting dad, you know? So I got to see both of them in partnership. You know, I think that's one thing I learned from both of my parents, that for, for either of them to succeed in their professional careers and also in raising us, that it was a partnership. And that's what I was looking for when I went to look for my husband and try to get married and then also launch my career as a scientist and a doctor. So, but I have to tell you, I don't know. (laughs) I don't know how my mom does it because now I'm living that experience and I'm like, and she was doing all of this like 20, 30 years ago, you know, 40 years ago, right? I'm about to be 40. She was doing this at a time when, you know, this work-life balance ideas, those things weren't as popular at the time. So one thing that uh, my mom was really, you know, she, we, we definitely had nannies. So we'd have a nanny from Nigeria that helped us out in the home. So that, at least for when we were really young, I think that was very helpful to my mom to have that. So that was one thing un- until we got to about, you know, 10, 12 years old, then we could take care of ourselves. And then the second was the partnership that she had with my father, that they really worked as a team. And then we had my extended family, you know, uncles, aunts, cousins, if, if they were coming to the U.S., they could also like take care of us, help drive us to activities and school. So I think that was how she kind of got things together. But it's hard in the United States. You know, it's hard where you don't have that same network of family immediately there at all times to help with, with child care and family. OK, so um, when she's not working, how is she at home? How does she relax when she's not working? Yeah, so I, my mom loves the water. She likes to swim. So anywhere that there's like beach, um, ocean, or like a swimming pool, my mom likes to be there. That's how she gets her exercise. And that's kind of what calms her. So she really likes that. Um, And then, you know, (laughs) she's a funny person, you know, and not so much that she's out there telling jokes, but just that she, she has that sense of silliness. You know, there's a little bit of silliness and fun that's inside her. So she might just randomly start dancing and singing a song that she's making up in just out of nowhere. She also likes to come up with nicknames or pet names, you know? So she had a pet name for me and each one of my brothers. And she even has pet names for each one of um, her grandchildren too. So she, she has that lightheartedness that will just come out spontaneously. I, I guess, I guess, um, a better interview with her will let us into all of this, you know, how she packs all of this together because really, it still really, really, really baffles me. Okay, so talking about nicknames and all of the, you know, lightness, what is your fondest memory? Maybe childhood memory with her and how was your relationship with her? Yeah, so I think I have a really nice relationship with my mom. One of the things I, I remember that I really enjoyed So when my brothers and I were smaller, she would um, take us to the local fast food restaurant. We would get hot dogs, hamburgers. And then instead of sitting in the fast food restaurant to eat, she would drive us to the local park. 
And then, you know, other people would have picnic blankets. My mom would spread a wrapper, you know, so she's, this is like picnic Nigerian style. You know, you go get, get your hamburger from wherever, drive to the local park, spread the wrapper, and we would have a picnic. I love those. I really love that so much. It's one of my fondest memories from when I was little, you know. <laughs> So let's talk about dad. You mentioned her him supporting her. In what ways, in what practical ways did he do this? Because the world celebrates him today. Whenever the whenever we're talking about oh Okonjo, we are love, people will always find a way to say, oh, she couldn't have done this without a husband. So how in, in what practical ways did you see um, him? You know support her and then was there any point in their marriage that um they had a clash you know um as a result of all of this work structure and work schedule mm -hmm. was there a point so i mean you know like i said marriage is a partnership and it's a give and take and so i think what i saw with my parents is that there's an ebb and flow you know so there were periods of time where my dad's career needed to be emphasized so for example, you know, um, after my mom moved to the United States because she had secured a job, my father couldn't just come straight away. He needed to complete training in the UK. And then when he moved to the US, unfortunately, because of the way the US medical training system is structured, he then had to complete more training. So there was like a focus on, okay, my mom needs to kind of hold things down while my dad is able to complete this additional training in the US. And so like, so there was a give and take there where my dad's career and training needed to be emphasized. Similarly, you know, there was, came a period where my mom got these opportunities. You know, first she had an opportunity possibly to work at the United Nations. In the end, that particular opportunity didn't pan out because both of them discussed, you know, they, they um, discussed risks, benefits, balance, you know, is this gonna work out for our family? And they came to the decision that at that point, that job wasn't going to be the best for the whole family. Later on, when my mom got the opportunity to serve, you know, in um, Obas Anjo's government as the first time she was finance minister, you know, again, it's the same discussion of, okay, where are we as a family? You know, let's take a look at this opportunity. This is an opportunity to impact significant change in Nigeria. You know, a lot of our, the kids, most of us were, we had, my youngest brother was still um, in high school but we were no longer little kids, you know? Most of us were either in college or had graduated. So, you know, I think that what happens is it's a discussion between the two of them about how is it going to work out for the family? And then, I mean, and then they come to that decision and they go. And they're, they're, I think my dad is also very cognizant that my mom has a lot of gifts and talents that can be deployed for the good of not just our family, but for the whole Nigeria at the time she served in government, and now for the world, you know, and he's so proud of her. He's so proud of her. And it's, it moves me so much because it just demonstrates that he has a lot of respect for both what men and what women can do too. And I think that's something that not only um, Americans, but also Nigerians and the world can benefit. Like pay attention. Women should not be treated as second class citizens, but as equals. We have a lot to contribute to the world. My dad showed that in, in the respect that he has for my mom and his pride in what she's doing. With our appointments now, what is what is the one thing, or let me say two, three things that you feel she really, really wants to achieve with this office? Yeah, so I think number one, she wants to use you know her platform and use the World Trade Organization to improve access to vaccines for everyone in the world. And it's particularly important because of COVID-19. I think my mom feels like the World Trade Organization has a fundamental role to play in making sure that it's not just rich countries, you know, or highly developed nations that have access to the vaccines, but that developing nations or under-resourced countries across the world, and therefore the people that live in those countries have access to these vaccines. So I think that's going to be one of her top priorities because, hey man, it's a, it's a global pandemic. We're all suffering because of this pandemic. So that's one thing. And I think the second thing is to bring the voices of developing nations and emerging economies to the table. You know, I think that's something that's very important to my mom. And I think it's one of the things she's going to try to emphasize in the course of running the WTO.
So after her appointment, do you think she'll still want to, you know, go forth in this in a career, you know, taking some other appointments or she is retiring? <laughs> I mean, to be honest with you, I don't think my mom can ever retire. I don't know if, if that's possible. <laughs> just like every time you think, okay, yeah, she's going to just, it'll be calm. We're all just going to be calm. Then and another amazing opportunity presents itself and she needs to contest, you know, because she's qualified and can bring a lot to the table. So we'll see. I, I can't really predict what she's going to do, but from me personally, I find it hard to believe that she's ever going to retire. <laughs> so wow well well let's let's see what what, what comes up next let's see exactly. just, we'll just be here waiting to you know hear the good news okay speaking yeah. about our choice of style um i think once <laughs> or twice i have seen her you know dress the english way she's always repping africa what do you what do you think brought about this why why is she yeah. doing that yeah, I mean, it's really for practical reasons. So, you know, when she was going to work, you, you can get a lot of these outfits made, you know, up and down, the Ankara, everything for very reasonable prices, you know? And they make unique outfits that look good, that help you stand out. Um, and it's easy to pick out an ensemble. So practical purposes for that reason. But then secondly, like what you said, like she's trying to represent for Africa. She's trying to represent for Nigeria. She's trying to represent for textile manufacturers. You know, my mom wants to encourage Ni the Nigerian economy. She wants to encourage the Nigerian economy to diversify, right? Like we should depend on things aside from oil. Oil is great, but like we should have other things just in case. And one of the things that Nigeria is so good at is our textiles, our fashion, our creativity. So I think in her own way, she was, you know, buy Nigerian, wear Nigerian. The same way the U.S. people do it all the time. You know, I'm American too. So I'm like, I'm proud to be an American, made in America, made in the USA. My mom is trying to show Nigerians and Africans, we can do that. We make great stuff. Let, let's, let's buy this stuff. Let's represent. And, you know, Nigerians are already doing that. So it's something to promote and encourage. Well, I, I really hope this, um, the dress sense, the... Um... The closing thing of be or you know of working in a corporate world. I really I hope it happens so fast. I I really hope you know I hope everyone gets to that level that we can say okay I can I can go to work and wear Ankara on a Monday. I really hope it comes through. Oh my God! I just finished speaking with Dr. Oyinye Iweala and my god it's really 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 an amazing session i had fun all through and she assured that she had fun as you just watched stay tuned to coco tv as we bring you many more of these exclusives i am lyle shobo thank you for joining and bye for now